Welcome back. Last episode, we saw our company earn the right to privateer in the Caribbean, reinvigorating the colony with hopes of plunder and fulfilling the Elizabethan dream. Privateering, they thought, could help recruit new settlers, pay their debts, and protect Protestantism from the Spanish menace. This week, they work to realize all their hopes. First things first, though, they had to decide how to proceed financially. And in February of 1636, the company decided to create a new joint stock company to raise the money they needed to pay their debts and their ongoing expenses. People who funded the new joint stock would split all profits for the next nine years, and only after that would anyone receive a return on the first round of investments. Furthermore, no one could invest in the new joint stock company until they had paid everything they'd promised and owed up to that point. And even though Brooks' offer to take over the company had been rejected, he still paid much more than anyone else. And he took over leadership of the new joint stock. With their financial hopes pinned on privateering, they also lightened the economic burden on their colonists and they prepared to send the first group of women to the colony. They now allowed the settlers to keep the profits from everything they'd grown in the past year, mostly tobacco, which they were trying to sell in the Netherlands. And then they lowered rents and promised to divide up the lands with certainty of tenure and potentially even inheritable leases. But they would only do that for settlers who were fit to remain on the island and who had paid off their debts to the company magazine. Each plantation would also be expected to produce a set amount of cotton and tobacco, which would be bought by the company at fixed prices, and part of that money would go to paying for the public works and officials. They'd also keep going to the mainland to get things like flax and detta, but the right to cultivate those things would be reserved to company agents. And they started to privateer. Warwick owned a fleet of privateering ships, which he hadn't been able to use since 1630. And in addition to sending those out under captains like Axe, Kamek, and Elfrith, The company announced that it would give letters authorizing privateering to any ship's captain in exchange for a third of the plunder. This was a great deal for both sides because it meant profit with no investment for the company, and it let the captains in on the ability to privateer, which was something they would never get any other way. They drafted their privateering commissions, and for once, they insisted that the Earl of Holland actually read them before signing them. William Rudyard was one of the captains who signed up, bringing him back into the Providence Island venture. Whether or not to allow him to go was the topic of some debate, especially given accusations that he had beaten a servant to death, sold company goods, and wasted gunpowder, But Pym and his brother successfully defended him, and he was not only returned to the island, but given some authority, and settlers were ordered to treat him nicely. They also started to discuss the possibility of some investors moving to Providence Island to help restore order and unity to the colony. The details hadn't been worked out, but Nathaniel Rich announced his intention to go. He was Warwick's cousin and deputy company governor, so he had both an interest in privateering and the authority to maybe make a difference. So the new governor, Hunt, 
set out in a small fleet of ships, including the Blessing, which was captained by William Rouse, and the Expectation. He took a batch of letters with instructions to the settlers, mostly trying to rein in the most provocative and factional behavior in the colony. In response to renewed complaints that Sherard had been imprisoned, they instructed that he be freed and encouraged to resume his ministry, and they forbade the island's government from disrupting any ministerial functions of any minister in the future. They didn't want the minister dictating how the government ran, but they also didn't want the government to control religious life. They apologized to Sherrod for his treatment, but also urged him to be more considerate concerning the denial of the sacrament in the future. It was a big deal, and he should at the very least warn people and give them a chance to repent before excommunicating them. They urged him to be a model of holiness, meekness, and peacefulness, if for no other reason than to silence the people who had opposed him. And they recommended that he consult privately with Hunt before denying the sacrament to anyone. They also instructed Hunt to keep the peace with the military who were present on the island and not to exercise his authority over them. They felt that Bell's treatment of the soldiers and sailors had already driven too many of them from the island, so Hunt needed to be deferential. Implicitly, they would rather offend the island's civilians than its military, who were more important. And to further evidence that viewpoint, they ordered colonists to start planting corn and cassava for an additional five to six hundred people. But before Hunt even reached Providence Island, the first problems with privateering emerged. Problems which will sound very familiar if you listened to some of the earliest episodes of this podcast. The fleet had been ordered to take the colonists to Providence Island and only after that to go off privateering. But before reaching the West Indies, the captain of the expectation died and Giles Murch took control of the ship. Instead of obeying his orders, he took the expedition to a Dutch settlement where he traded the supplies that he was carrying, supplies intended for the colonists, for slaves, and then he carried the slaves to another island where he sold them and pocketed the cash. You can only imagine how frustrating that would be for the colony-bound passengers. They were wholly dependent on and subservient to the captains, and the captains showed no desire to actually get them to their destination. In the moment, they couldn't have had any idea of how much longer they'd be spending at sea. And when the expectation re-encountered Rouse's blessing, they planned to attack the Spanish town of Santa Marta. At this point, Hunt demanded that the settlers be dropped off at Providence Island. And they agreed, mostly because the colony was on their way anyway, so they might as well. Rouse and Murch agreed on a rendezvous place in time where they'd meet to plan their attack after dropping off the settlers. But Murch ran late, and Rouse decided to attack the town himself. And he was unsuccessful. The Spanish beat him and took him and his crew captive. As a captive, he met a young English Dominican who was traveling with the Spanish. The man's name was Thomas Gage, and he and Rouse formed at least something of an affinity for each other. Gage had grown disillusioned with the Spanish, and he's actually someone who will meet again, but not as a Catholic. He'll go on to become an associate of Cromwell and one of the more ardent Puritans in England. But... Rouse had been captured and was sent to prison in Seville for the foreseeable future. 
On Providence, Hunt took his position as governor, and contrary to his orders, he neither showed Bell respect, nor did he coddle the captains. He allowed any and all judicial proceedings against Bell, not even reining in the most merciless ones, and he tried to force Bell to show the letters which had been sent to him privately. When the soldiers decided to steal Bell's property and to take all his servants and slaves, Hunt did nothing to protect him, and at that point, Bell sold his remaining possessions and sailed for England. Bell may not have been liked, but he had actually been a mediating presence on the island, and without him, factional clashes grew even more vitriolic. Hunt, who was fundamentally one of Brooke's protégés, so more civilian inclined, and who had had such a terrible experience with the captains on the way to the island, was also appalled by the military behavior on the island and took the civilian side. Elfrith, in particular, found himself in a position of such weakness that he was even attacked by some of the other captains, including Axe, who said that he had messed up the colony's forts. And at this point in time, the island thwarted its second Spanish attack. Bell returned to England, thoroughly disgusted with Providence Island. He told the investors that it was a better fortress than it was a colony, and in many ways his experiences there mirrored those of Governor Harvey in Virginia. The company saw the problems and criticized Hunt for allowing attacks on Bell, which were simply indirect attacks on the company, and for allowing discord to prevail when they had ordered him to sow the seeds of peace. They said it was very clear that public justice had been used to settle private differences, and even worse, this was against someone who the company had specifically chosen as its representative. Within the company, conflict began to grow between Pym and Brooke. Pym now refused to continue serving as treasurer, saying that because the new joint stock was under Brooke's control, he was no longer needed. He wanted an extra share in company profits to compensate for the effort and expense involved in having run the company's affairs in the past. The company refused, didn't replace Pym, and had Jessup take over any of his remaining responsibilities. Nathaniel Rich died at this point, deflating company plans to send investors to restore peace to the island. And a plague outbreak indefinitely postponed the recruitment of additional soldiers and settlers. And they had to discuss what to do about William Rouse. Should they pay the money to get him out of the Spanish prison? To what extent were investors responsible for rescuing privateers and their crews who got captured? I mean, capture was a definite threat associated with privateering, and Rouse's actions had been irresponsibly risky. They were already in debt, so how much more money should they borrow to rescue the reckless? They couldn't agree, and they put off a decision. In Providence Island, conflicts between the interests of settlers and privateers continued to cause problems. The company tried to get privateers to transport colonists and supplies to the island, thinking that this was a logical solution to transportation cost problems. Privateers were getting the opportunity for plunder, and they were going across the Atlantic anyways, so the least they could do would be to cut down on company expenses by transporting passengers. But the privateers resented this. Passengers needed food, and transporting them would distract from the mission of privateering. Plus, Ship's crews would sail for free with the possibility of getting prizes, but they would demand wages if they were expected to transport people. So privateers resented 
deprioritized and even refused to do this, leaving the company to continue bearing the burden of transportation, even though many of the people being transported were soldiers who were necessitated in large part by the privateers. Privateering made repeated Spanish attack a near inevitability, meaning that the colony needed an increased military presence. So now, the colony imported active military officers from fortifications on the Essex coast and demanded military perfection from the civilians, with training twice a week until that was achieved. And the civilians, servants, and slaves would be expected to work on the fortifications again, without compensation, which the company again said was for the colonists' safety, though that was now even less convincing than before. And as this happened, the civilians started to withdraw into their own separate, closed society, away from the rough, crass, libertine military. Is part of godly congregations in Puritan areas of England, they had been dismayed by the political direction of their home country, but now they were surrounded by swearing, drunkenness, lewd, and outright violent behavior. Axe, for instance, slaughtered a group of Indians on the mainland, and he was chastised for it by the company and told that God would avenge the Indians' blood, but he was still allowed to remain in the colony. The civilians found themselves subservient to people who were brutal and domineering and obviously more valued by the company than they were. Even if they found a perfect commodity, it wasn't going to get better. So they withdrew. They did what they were ordered to do, but otherwise they formed a society within a society, grew their tobacco, and kept to themselves. And both they and the investors increasingly relied on slavery to make up for the ever-growing labor shortage. And at this point, the civilians sent the company an ultimatum. The investors hadn't sent either the 500 settlers they'd promised or new supplies. And worst of all, the civilians were excluded from the mainland ventures, while the domineering, corrupt, and ungodly captains were given the chance to get rich. So they set a deadline and said that if the company hadn't sent the colonists a ship of supplies before the deadline, they would simply leave the island. They even sent Rishworth to England, authorizing him to speak as strongly as he needed to, to get them what they wanted. But problems aside, the colony had more hope than it had had in years. And the company could look at other colonies and feel pretty decent by comparison. Virginia and Bermuda had both dealt with worse, and the antinomian controversy was raging in Massachusetts, and that alarmed the investors as much as anything in England. Not only was the persecution of Vane and Hutchinson borderline tyrannical, They worried that the colony was moving towards straightforward apostasy. So the investors were sure that they were on the right track. If they had to choose between tyranny and chaos, they would choose chaos. They just needed some time to sort out minor issues. And though the investors remained justifiably optimistic at this point, The fact that there was a settler mutiny right after the company had made a significant round of concessions to the colonists makes this a decent time to look at Cooperman's other two reasons that Providence Island failed while North America survived. 
We already discussed civilian control over the military, but the other two issues that she isolated were private property and local government. When I said that Providence Island failures showed a little bit of the future American ideological foundation, this was a significant part of what I was talking about. Colonists came to America in large part because of the ability to own land, which they would likely never have in England. In the decade that Providence Island repeatedly tried and failed to recruit settlers, the lack of land was a big part of the reason. Thousands and thousands of people were pouring into New England and even the Chesapeake, even though life in the Chesapeake was so much harsher and more unpleasant than anywhere else in the New World, including Providence Island, and that's because they could own land there. Providence Island investors recognized the importance of land ownership, but they saw Providence Island as their private land, not land that they needed to be distributing to their colonists. The Chesapeake had a big problem with vacant land, and the Providence Island Company was trying in its own way to achieve a unified society. And part of that was maintaining the colony as their own piece of land. Another part of that was having a small, unified company issuing commands from London in contrast to the unwieldy Virginia company. And that's a big part of the reason that they never allowed local governance. But local governance proved to be the only way that any colony could reduce resentment at having to work on and invest in public projects. Colonists resented contributing to even the most basic projects if they didn't have local, usually elected government. And when distant authorities commanded them to work on stuff that wasn't as straightforward in its benefits, that just proved to them that they were right about being forced to work on stuff that had nothing to do with them. But almost immediately, when governance started to come from local, elected, or at least partially elected bodies, people started to accept it. And that's a big reason why there was mutiny after mutiny among Providence Island citizens. And it's kind of interesting to put the Revolutionary War into this context and perspective. Taxes and forced labor were fine if and only if the orders came from a local government whose legitimacy they had agreed to. It wasn't even a question of ideology, at least not at first. It was a question of necessity because this system emerged as the only one which enabled these fledgling societies separated from centuries of political tradition to make sense. But both of these things did become a massive part of the American ideology and identity. And next episode, we'll see the lack of these things build up into a full-fledged crisis.